Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Nation Watch. Today, 14 January 2024, and we have a um, very important event coming up on the 20th of January, and we'll bring you that message right now. It is time for all of Guyana to unite on the one banner and rally against the high cost of living. It's tearing our families apart. Enough is enough. Come rally with the APNU plus AFC Coalition at the Burnham Basketball Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown, on Saturday, January 20th, starting at 5 p.m. Come and hear the leader of the opposition, Aubrey C. Norton, Member of Parliament, as he addresses the nation. Come and hear the AFC leader, Kamraj Ramjatan, all the members of Parliament, members of the private sector, and members of civil society. Yes, Guyanese, it's time to send a message to the incompetent and corrupt PPP. It is time for the people to stand against the high cost of living. Saturday, January 20th at 5 p.m. at Burnham Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown. Come out and let your voices be heard. I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. Come again, can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. Right, so join us on Saturday 20th and we'll discuss the rising cost of living in great details. Today, our program will take a slightly changed format. We will, in the first half, be speaking with Ambassador Ronald Austin on the question of the Guyana-Venezuela territorial controversy. And after that, we will be speaking with Mr. Elson Lowe, um, economic advisor to the leader of the opposition, on what we can expect from the budget 2024. So, Mr. Austin, I'd like to welcome you to Nation Watch, and as always, it's a, an honor to have you on the program. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I, I thank you for inviting me back. Um, I, as I've indicated to you, I've grown a bit concerned as to where we are on the border controversy at the present time in this country. <clears throat> as I mentioned before, um, one did not have to be a genius to see where we would be after several weeks of frenzied activity on, on the question of the, of the border controversy with <laughs> seminars, a lot of high individuals pronouncing on the matter. Um, uh, university, the university got involved and so on. And what is currently very troubling to me is that this intense activity is not tapering off. Um, this happened before. And it's something that the, the I think the opposition anticipated and, and told the president, um, I think, in the joint statement, uh, the draft joint statement, and I think subsequently the leader of the opposition, that you have to set up a structure that could monitor and keep on assessing what is going on between ourselves and the border controversy and so that we could take a break from the action. What is not good for this country? It is constant stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. Well, it's clear the government is not in favor of a structured um, parliamentary apparatus to really, or mechanism to really deal with the issue. But we have a short time today. And so I want to, having noted your concern and, and say to you that I do share those concerns, I want to shift gears into something that is in fact troubling with respect to this matter. I have in my hand here um, a Starbuck News, April 1, 2027 piece. And it says, it is headlined, OECS has accepted Venezuela's sovereignty over Bird Island. And it quotes Ralph Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And I want to read from this document. Since Vincent and the Grenadines Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, said the OECS has accepted Venezuela's sovereignty over Bird Island and that he would not allow anyone to dictate whether or not he should put pressure on the government of Venezuela in relation to the issue. Bird Island is a low lying, uninhabited island situated off the coast of Dominica to which Venezuela lay claim, lays claim. If the island is recognized as Venezuelan, it would potentially permit Caracas to increase the area of our exclusive, exclusive economic zone substantially. Venezuela 
sees Esequibo in pretty much the same light. Mm -hmm. What are the implications for not only um, the OEC states, but the entire Caribbean region were Venezuela to have its way? And it appears from the same article that it, it does because uh, it says here that last year, Dominica Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt, in a break with traditional OECS position on the status of Bird Island, public, public, publicly acknowledged Venezuelan sovereignty over it. Look, I think we, we've got to face up to the to what is in front of us. It is right and proper for the government, for the rest of the society, um, um, and for the top. Um, spokesmen and intellectuals in the society to focus on the ICJ. But you cannot lock yourself away into the legal side of this matter. It's a much broader issue, and I uh, certainly I, I've expressed my uh, my concern about this. While you, you are focused on the ICJ and what the ICJ can do for you, we well, we we have allowed Venezuela to run free in what I would call the geopolitical space in, in the Caribbean. And not only have they been allowed to run free in that geopolitical space, they've got good collaborators in Rwanda. I, I use the word deliberately, collaborators, which includes um, our friend um, um, Ralph um, Gonzalez. And to answer your question directly, this is a troubling matter. These are the, the OECS plus the, 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 the CARICOM as a whole. It used to be called our first line of defense, our first line of diplomatic defense. That is the entity to which we turn whenever we have, uh, we have problems, like the problems we have with Venezuela over the border controversy. And as you, as you might have witnessed um, within recent times, that is no longer um, a guaranteed area of, of, of support. Board Island, for, for decades, was defended, sovereignty was defended by the rest of the Caribbean. And suddenly, somewhere um, towards the end of the 90s or early, um, early 2000s, we suddenly discovered that um, the, the, the OECS states, as a result of Petrocari, um, the Petrocari Fund and the amount of money they were getting um, to import oil and, and for, for the economic uh, uh, reasons, suddenly started to develop a very close relationship with Venezuela. There was a summit, I think, in 2050, um, which was attended primarily by, by a lot of our Oh, yes. Then Venezuela um, branched out with, with Trinidad uh, over, over their maritime boundary and signed something, a dragon head, which, which um, one Trinidadian uh, politician said was the best gift they've got uh, for Christmas. Now, in all of these things, the, the consequences that we could all see, when Mayor Motley and Ralph Gonzalez spoke at the press conference sometime recently, they said they wanted a zone of peace, and you can see what they were saying. In other words, um, we don't want anything to happen to upset our, our um, deal, our <laughs> deal <laughs> relationship with Venezuela. Now, that is not good for Guyana. You know, if we do not have the the OECS and CARICOM, as I said, as a whole, as our first line of defense, what it is exactly do we have? Who are our best friends in these circumstances? Well, this this paper from Sir Ronald Sanders nails the issue when he says that both the Prime Ministers of Dominica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are reported to have said that the OECS countries, which were previously vociferously upset about the ramifications of the maritime boundaries of Venezuela, measuring its exclusive economic zone from the Aves Island or Bird Rock, have now accepted Venezuela's sovereignty over the island or rock. But but you know the, the, the question is asked who accepted it? Did CARICOM accept it? But but he, CARICOM on record is saying that we agree that Venezuela has my, the right to to broad island. I don't know anything about that. And this paper also makes it clear that um it is not recognized by the Love Sea Convention as an island either. It's recognized as a rock. As a rock, but Venezuela has <coughs> done what in their mind is sufficient to elevate it to the position of, of an island. island. They call it Alvish Island. Well, by the way, they're not members of the, the Love of the Sea Convention. Precisely. Mm. 
Now, we are seeing clear, clearly the impact of the petro caribbean deals mm -hmm. uh, between Venezuela and individual states within CARICOM. Yeah. And we're seeing, particularly the OECS um, states. Can Guyana A be confident that Ralph Gonzalez in this new role um, in the issue of the territorial controversy is a person who will be neutral and will pursue a course that will be ben mutually beneficial to, to the parties concerned? Or, or is he partial? And we'll get down to some more of that. And secondly, can Guyana now continue to boast of that bedrock of support from CARICOM regarding its sovereignty? Well, uh, as far as Prime Minister Raghun is concerned, the facts speak for this. Um, I don't want to express a personal view of, of, of uh, Prime Minister Gonzalez, but but um, if you, as a as a head of of, of um, CARICOM state, uh, one of the leading members of the Caribbean community, you are photographed with a map um, on Venezuelan soil. I think it was at the Venezuelan embassy or consulate yeah. um, with a map of Venezuela, which includes um, the um, Despicable, and turn around and tell. Um, the rest of the world that you you were unaware of what the map represented. That 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 I I don't think my my nine year old grandson would believe that. But you know? more 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 important to me because I was coming to this as the next substantive question. More important to me in this matter of Ralph and this map is the official position taken by the government of Guyana on this issue. Ralph says that he stood behind this thing, but he never knew what it really was. He knew it was a map of Venezuela, but not that the scribble was included. You are a head of state in CARICOM. This issue of Ghana and Venezuela and the territorial controversy dates way back. As a head of a CARICOM state, you are to be fully informed on this matter. He claims now to be fully informed on the matter. How can the government of Ghana accept that he didn't know what it was he was standing there? And this is what is more troubling for me. I would be very country. surprised if the government of Ghana truly believed what Ralph Gonzalez said. I don't think anybody believes what Ralph Gonzalez has been around for a long time. The border controversy has been, a, uh, been around a long time. It has been in the councils of the Caribbean community for over 30 years. You can't say you're unaware of it, or you, you can't say you, you're unaware that Venezuela, on repeated occasions, at, at, on public occasions, would publish maps of their country, which included Desikabo. Ralph Gonzalez must know that, because we protested on several occasions when Venezuela, Venezuela tried to do that. You know, So if he's presented with, with I can't believe that a, a man who's a PhD, a lawyer, and an experienced politician sits there and allow, uh, 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 he, he calls it, um, I can't remember what, what um, derogatory term he used, um, what was trust in front of him, that uh, he did not bother to look at what um, he, um, he was given. That is not the, the reaction of, of, of an experienced politician. But is his position that he didn't know what it was possibly influenced by the petro Caribbean deal? Of course, I, I don't. I, I said a, a moment ago, um, the facts speak for themselves. Days after the Argyle Agreement, he had, I think, his two hundred and seventy million dollars written off as, as, as debt to Venezuela. Ten percent of the national debt, I believe it was. Of 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 of, uh, of cent cent. Yeah. The Ralph knows which 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 how, how his bread is buttered, you know. But it's it's regrettable that he's, he's, he's going to butt his bread at our expense. You know, I, I think I think that that's quite unfortunate. You know? But attempting to do it might not be bad on his side, but us as a country accepting it. I expected a more robust response from our government. You know, but I know Ralph enjoys a pretty good relationship with both the, the president and the, and, the, and the vice president. I don't know if that influenced their, their, 
the response to, 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 to the, that rather unsavory incident in which he was involved. Do you believe that we are at a stage now where the government of Guyana, in that unified position with the uh, parliamentary opposition, should call for Ralph's immediate withdrawal, having regard to the Bird Island statement, which no one spoke about for a number of years, mm -hmm. and his um, association with this map, and that very flimsy if not infantile um, explanation of, of, of why he stood behind it. Well, the, the, as they said, the facts speak for themselves. I mean, if you are an, an, if you are an interlocutor, um, you are one of the key people um, encouraging negotiations between Venezuela and Guyana. Your hands have to be clean. You can't be seen to be partial on one side or the other side. The, uh, in any negotiation, if, if, if you are the person um, trying to get the two sides um, to come together, you have to have some kind of integrity and credibility with both sides. I don't think there is anybody in Guyana right now, if you stop the average citizen on the road and ask them, what do you think of Ralph Gonzalez as one of the main players in, in the, the current um, crisis in Venezuela, people will tell you bluntly, nobody, I think, has, has trusted Ralph um, with this matter for the longest while. And I think, um, I can't speak to the leader of the opposition. I think you take a very hard position with Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez has an island um, to, to protect and keep. That is very easy. We're going to lose five-eighths of, of, of our country, the richest part of this country, if we're not capable. Ambassador Austin, in this conversation that I believe Nation Watch started this conversation on the controversy as a public issue, they have been symposia, they have been, there have been other interviews around the country, other public presentations and so on. You had, in outlining the history of this issue, spoken to step by step the periods between, well, first 1899, what happened between then and 1962 and what happened between then leading to 1966 and the signing of the Geneva Agreement and so on. But in the wider conversation, folks seem to have been omitting this, the important period, 1962-66. Yeah. For the benefit of our viewers, in the remaining minutes, maybe 10 of them or so, could you fill us in on the important developments that took place between 1962, well, starting there, and culminating in the Geneva Agreement of 66. You know, I, 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 I was uh, being curious over so there. Rest and relax a bit. Uh, as one must do if you live in this part of the world uh, from time to time. And I was looking out um, towards my own country and I was listening to a lot of these uh, programs or holy reports on these programs. And all of, a, all of a sudden, you have a lot of people who claim to be an experts on, 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 on the border control. And some of them are really um, doing damage to the cause of this country by purveying information which is not accurate. Let me give you um, one example. One leading official in, in responding to the question of whether Mr. Burnham did um, something which is not right by signing the Geneva Agreement. Virtually elided the period between 1962 um, right into 1966. There was a lot of terror of, of political, political, economic um, territory in between the, those two events. After Venezuela um, raised a question at the at the at the United Nations and announced um, that they would revive the claim to uh, to Gaia. the British government. In trying to deal with, 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 with the problem because it, be, it became a little hot potato for them. What they did not want um, in, the 19, in 1962 was to be denounced again as an imperialist state. So they tried to find the, uh, the, quick, the quickest solution. And what they proposed was a re examination of, of, the, of the document, the historical documents, um, which came out of the 1899 um, uh, agreement. Um, and there were several meetings. You know, uh, it, it's that man who died quite recently, H.R. Prasad, who was Dr. Jacob's first secretary. 
he's one of the first experts to, um, to, to look at the document. So they met, they met in London, they met in Caracas, um, and then they went back um, to London. I could not find the solution. The bone of contention at that time was whether if the experts, once they presented their report, if the two sides, Britain and, and Venezuela, would not then um, elevate the, 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 um, the, the issue by having a ministerial um, uh, discussion on the matter. Now, the British always suspected that once it went to the level of ministers, Venezuela would ask that they discuss the substantive issue. Remember, in 1962, in making the proposal to examine the documents, the British government was clear. They said it did not indicate in any way any substantive discussion on the border which was settled in 1889. And what happened was, and by the way, for the record, Dr. Jagan, as premier, consulted by the British government, agreed to the re-examination of the documents. Eventually, and it's a fascinating, um, uh, historical um, uh, event, which is described beautifully by uh, Sir Big Joseph. British economic and commercial interests entered the picture, and gradually the British um, opposition started shifting, as it did um, on, on previous occasions. And eventually there was a ministerial um, discussion of the documents, and that is how they ended up in Geneva. But the question of the re-examination of the documents, if you look at any, any um, television program, any, anything written by a, a, all of the so-called experts, you look hard to find them. And I want to say that this, um, at, at this point is a matter of seriousness. People undertake the deal with the border controversy as a serious matter of national interest. Had better be careful to get the information and the facts that they um, put to the Guyanese people, to get those facts correct and right. Final question on the territorial controversy for today, um, Ambassador Oscar. A lot has been made of the leader of the opposition's um, support for government's, government's position. Mm -hmm. A lot has been said about, positively, about mm -hmm. the motion in the National Assembly, which was unanimously passed, ensuring support of both sides. Not much has been done by the government side to give real life to that commitment of national unity. In your estimation, has the government handled this matter properly? I, I think much more could have been done. I, after I came back on the first occasion from, uh, from I, 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 I engaged the leader of the opposition. And I pointed out to him that the question of national unity and the question of as far as the border controversy is concerned, is not a, it's not a, an event that, um, that, that stands by itself. It should happen in the context of, 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 of the greater unity of the nation. I, and it's, unity on the border cannot uh, survive if you have this unity in other areas which approximate um, the, the question of the border controversy. It has to be a whole a whole issue. It has to be, if you if we are cooperating on the border, surely there are other areas in which the two governments can cooperate to subserve the question of, of, of the of the national position on the border controversy. And that is what I, I've not seen because the, the, the question of the unity of the opposition, the government, only comes up when the border controversy comes up. That should not be. But, but in terms of the actual handling of the situation, the diplomatic corps doesn't seem to be as active as I anticipate the diplomatic corps to have been in these circumstances. The whole question of quietly engaging allies, useful, but reporting to the populace, there's, there's a void. You mean the local diplomatic community? Ours, our diplomatic missions. 
No, because what I've discovered, you know, the I, I I'm not unless I'm I, I'm not um, listening carefully or, or seeing what's going on correctly. I I've, I've seen no role for the mission so far. When we were in deep trouble in the eighties, when Venezuela was all over again, flying over, blowing up on two and so on. Noel Sinclair was before the General Assembly. Um, very often, it's there in the Odi Nationalist book. And he kept up, um, uh, you, you know, a kind of diplomatic aggression against Venezuela, which they did that because it caused them to back off of a lot of their very aggressive positions. But I don't see that coming out of, of our mission at the UN. I don't see it coming out of our mission in Caracas. You know, incidentally, when the, the then, how is it possible that President Maduro can land in St. Vincent with a map of Venezuela on the tail end of his plane? Um, uh, with Ven with Esco included. And we seem to be, I don't know, it doesn't seem to me that our delegation was aware that he was arriving with his plane. And that plane had acquired some notoriety before the St. Vincent meeting. And if the mission in Venezuela was doing its work and was on the, on the ball, that should have been something that should have been reported here in Georgia. And the re relevant actions regarding the meeting and participation or non-participation obviously would have been taken. Yeah. We are perhaps not where we ought reasonably to be. Ms. Austin, I want to thank you very much for making yourself available. I know there's a lot more that we should be discussing and we will be discussing by God's grace in the coming weeks. Thank you very much for joining me. No watch. Thank you. Over to Elson. If yeah. Elson believes that the, we, we will. <laughs> the budget has nothing to do with the border controversy. Think again. <laughs> we will take a break and We'll be back with Mr. Elson Lowe right. in a minute. No more. I can't, I can't no more. It is time for all of Guyana to unite on the one banner and rally against the high cost of living. It's tearing our families apart. Enough is enough. Come rally with the APNU plus AFC Coalition at the Burnham Basketball Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown, on Saturday, January 20th, starting at 5 p.m. Come and hear the leader of the opposition, Aubrey C. Norton, Member of Parliament, as he addresses the nation. Come and hear the AFC leader, Kamraj Ramjatan, all the members of Parliament, members of the private sector, and members of civil society. Yes, Guyanese, it's time to send a message to the incompetent and corrupt PPP. It is time for the people to stand against the high cost of living. Saturday, January 20th at 5 p.m. at Burnham Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown. Come out and let your voices be heard. I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. Come again, can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. Bring your fed up lesson common Saturday. Welcome back. I'm joined by Mr. Elson Lowe, who is the economic advisor to the leader of the opposition, and we're going to spend the next, what, 28 minutes or so um, looking at what there is to be expected in what will be Ghana's first trillion dollar budget. Again, the largest budget ever in the history of Guyana. Elson, welcome to Nation Watch. Hi, thank you for having me. It's definitely going to be an interesting time looking at this, uh, this new budget. Um, you mentioned a trillion dollar uh, budget, potentially. We know that overall spending will be in excess of a trillion this year, given that last year uh, was in excess of 900 billion spent, including all of those supplementals. So we could easily get above a trillion this year in spending. The People's Progressive Party has been releasing bits and pieces of information um, we we have been having um, we've been having clips coming out about what six billion dollars for a police station, one hundred eighty four billion, one hundred eighty four million United United States dollars for uh, um, the highway. Um, we hear about the plan to to construct a fixed bridge across the Burbese River when the floating bridge that sits there is functional. Yeah and has not yet repaid its investors. Yeah. The national insurance scheme has not yet collected yeah. on its ordinary shares. Do you see more and more mega infrastructure projects um, pouring money into the pocket of the 1% rich and famous 
Um, and do you see any anything there for the working poor of this country? I think we uh, definitely will expect uh, further heavy infrastructure spending. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, to take a step back, we want to help Guyanese to get some perspective on is that uh, given the changes that have happened to our economy, the growth of the budget, uh, really you need to be seeing not just spending on infrastructure, but spending in ways that will directly and swiftly, one, uh, deal with the cost of living crisis, and two, improve people's standard of living. Uh, this wholesale focus only on infrastructure, the neglect of education, uh, spending, that I think has concerned a lot of people. And we want to you know, give our viewers a bit of uh, a bit of perspective on this because, you know, last year's spending was equivalent to 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014's budgets combined. Now, uh, did you experience uh, five years worth of uh, so-called progress in one year last year? Or is it that they spend a lot of money and people's lives hardly, hardly change? That to me is exceptionally concerning because it means that going forward, you can see the government push out budget after budget with people's lives, little change. We would also like to mention to Guyanese that uh, this year, Guyana, uh, adjusting for prices uh, on a per capita GDP basis for uh, income per person, uh, the country really um, is the 10th wealthiest in the entire world, 10th highest GDP per capita. Now, some will say, oh, that doesn't mean anything. But I would point out that the economy has tripled. The national budget has also tripled. Therefore, money is being spent. It's just that the money is not being spent on you Guyanese, improving your day-to-day -day lives. And so we've got a situation where... Um, the more that is spent without any seeing that kind of progress, the more concern there is. And we can talk about some specific policies and areas that would immediately provide a lot of relief to Guyanese, uh, and which the PVP, very reasonable policies, the PVP has no interest in. It's very sad to see, um, and it reflects the experience of many other oil companies or countries that have had um, significant corruption in their um, system. Interesting. Um, the parliamentary opposition has been putting on the table uh, the building of um, sustainable communities. Mr. Bolkan, former minister, spoke of um, how we do that extensively on this program some time back. The parliamentary opposition has also been speaking about a minimum livable wage, which it pegs at $150 per month. $150,000. $150,000 per month, sorry. And the opposition has also been clamoring for the removal of PSU earned taxes on that amount. Um, and a number of other critical measures mm -hmm. that will impact the lives of the working class Guyanese. Mm -hmm. What we have been seeing over the years of the PPP's return to government is a heavy emphasis on further enriching the rich while celebrating almost poverty by ensuring that it continues to persist. What measures do you anticipate this budget will present to alleviate the suffering of the poor, if any? Well, you know, what the PPP likes to do is to uh, put forward small incremental changes. So the tax threshold, they may budge by a little bit. Um, you may see another $5,000 for some cash grant somewhere, $10,000 for some cash grant. Something that is uh, very limited. You may see uh, some more of this part-time workers' job, which is, you know, four to $50,000 a month. People can't survive on that. Those types of very uh, limited measures. Whereas you've got the fiscal space to do something much more comprehensive. Um, we've also seen them talk a bit about the uh, University of Guyana, step by step, whatever that means, free. But at the same time, they're talking about putting on uh, work requirements. So you have to be working in order to, to receive that kind of relief. Uh, so it is expected to be a heavy focus on infrastructure and a very limited uh, focus on anything to do with poverty anything to do with the cost of living. 
and anything to do with more immediate improvements in people's standard of living. This, I think, um, contrasts really sharply with what we've been saying. You spoke about the $150,000 minimum livable income that we believe that Guyanese, uh, every Guyanese should be, should be making. Now, that uh, comes in the form of many different programs, but at, uh, one of the things the government could easily do in this budget is to raise that tax threshold right up to $150,000. We believe that no one who is a, a lower to middle income bracket in Guyana should be paying taxes at all. Uh, and that would, of course, put a very substantial amount of money in the pockets of, of uh, so many, so many Guyanese. Uh, one of the other benefits that that would have is that uh, these types of policies abroad internationally have been shown to increase your labor force participation rate. So more people will start to look for work. Because they know that you know they don't have to pay taxes, your income received will be higher. So that will also have secondary benefits for the economy as a whole. Um, so what we're saying, therefore, is that there are policies that have um, more than one benefit that we, we could uh, enact tomorrow, but they have no interest in in that kind of approach. They believe that uh, they should just give a little trickle to benefit, uh, a little trickle to pa pacify. I would say. Uh, uh, one or two Guyanese and keep chugging on ahead with their very aggressive uh, infrastructure heavy policy. Now, that's not to say that we don't believe that there is a role for infrastructure to play in the economy. That is absolutely true. But there must be the correct balance. And you cannot have uh, a country with the, <laughs> a country with the 10 times highest GDP per capita adjusted for prices in the entire world. And so many people living in uh, desperate poverty, begging on the streets. It is uh, ridiculous. And, uh, you know, we, while infrastructure is important, there's nothing wrong with a more gradual pace uh, and a focus on ensuring that we eradicate poverty and that we help to, to move forward in developing our non oil plan. This thing has been troubling me a little bit. <laughs> the government says that if you increase wages and salaries, you'll be contributing to inflation. So the measures it took were one, set aside $5 billion out of mm. in excess of $900 billion to, not cushion, even, not even a percent. to cushion the impact of yeah. the high cost of living. Yeah. And if you want an understanding of the high cost of living, it's four plantings for $700, right? Then it gives an end of year increment of less than 1% of the national budget. While that national budget, more than 40% of it goes to public infrastructure development works. And we know that at least 42 cents from every dollar in public infrastructure projects gets wasted for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. Now, if almost half of almost half the budget <laughs> slips yes, yes. into the economy yeah. without having been earned, are you still going to continue to pack money in the public infrastructure works and suggest that it's not going to fuel inflation the way mm -hmm. genuine worker emoluments would? I mean, it's well, confusing. one of the uh, one of the core issues um, that uh, various economists are discussing right now is the question of the inflation rate in Guyana. You've seen the vice president say, "Oh, less than two percent inflation." which I think anybody who shops in the market will tell you that it can't be that. We've seen the US government, State Department, come out with a 6.6% .6 inflation number, which I think is more realistic. Uh, if you look at the change in the budget year over year, uh, that meets my, my uh, expectations that I had at the beginning of the year. Um, now, what that means is that, uh, whereas in the US is an example, we've gone out to a 3.4% inflation rate. Diana, we're looking at nearly twice the, the amount of inflation. That indicates to me that the government's policies in fighting inflation have not been effective at all. Uh, but also, uh, the focus on uh, very aggressive infrastructure spending has put a lot of money into the economy that has not resulted in uh, expansion of uh, production of goods to meet 
uh, this, the, the additional demand. Now, uh, that's when it comes to food items. Uh, you know, uh, I give you one pretty classic example is the, uh, there was a project for um, development of local wheat. I don't know if you remember that, mm-hmm. 1970. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard anything about that in the longest while. I, I, I would like to see if they made any progress in that regard. But the thing that's funny about it is that uh, it seems to me that it wasn't clear to them that in order for that to bring down the price of flour in Ghana, they would have had to produce wheat at a lower price than it's being produced internationally, accounting for shipping and so on. So that was highly unlikely to have been able to succeed. But that's what they're, they're putting money towards. And then when you look at the waste in the infrastructure spending in this country, that gives you also a perspective as to uh, money being spent, the progress not being made. I don't have to tell you about um, so many roads and, and projects that are stalled. Cemetery Road is the most recent but one people are complaining about. Stalled by, I think it's by- uh, Spirits, uh, evil spirits. St- st- stalled by evil spirits. Um, then you've got a, a school that is being constructed by a, a former football uh, personnel and entertainers, uh, where there was a lot of outcry. It's the size of the contract. The school is again substantially delayed. And this has been the experience of Guyanese uh, across the board. Um, in, when it comes to electricity generation in Guyana, more blackouts rather than less blackouts, even though you know, the national budget has expanded sharply. Uh, these are all things that have uh, really raised a lot of concerns for Guyanese as to whether we're getting value for money. Now, the downside, of course, of not getting value for money when it is hundreds of millions of dollars that are involved is that money that could otherwise have been put towards dealing with the cost of living crisis, improving wages and salaries and so on, that money is, is, is going to waste. Um, one form of waste is just not using the money efficiently. A lot of our face is corruption. And uh, one of the interesting things being discussed is, um, you know, if you steal 10% of the top of a project, it's not that you can run out and spend that 10%. You have to hide that 10% because of the anti-money laundering laws. So that then gets pulled out of the economy is in your mattress somewhere. And therefore is not resulting in the type of employment gains and so on that maybe uh, the economists might forecast. That is a big problem uh, right now in the economy uh, that we're facing. I want to make a last point on, on the note of, of waste because some folks may say, oh, yeah, well, why are you talking about that social money? What happens if a few dollars is wasted? Just to give an example of the gas, the energy uh, plant, the gas, gas the energy project. Um, that project, just uh, not following the feasibility study and moving that um, site from Clanbrook to Wales has resulted in an in excess of 100 million US that has been wasted. That it has increased the cost of the project with no tangible benefit. 100 million US, it's $100,000 for every single household. That's the cost of the Demerara Harbor Bridge almost. Well, there you go. That's $100,000 per household that could have gone towards the energy cost of the crisis, but instead has been wasted for no reason other than those at the top don't want to listen to feasibility studies, carry out proper studies and, and, and work with them. So what you hear is always a no-brainer. I yeah. had a conversation with Mr. Um, Winston Jordan right here on Nation Watch. Could have been more than a year ago. Mm-hmm. Could have been, I, I don't recall when it was. But in that conversation, Mr. Jordan made the point that food inflation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm was in its double digits. Mm -hmm. I believe he mentioned the number close to 20%. I don't want to misquote or misrepresent, but that is is my recollection. And so if you're talking about paying workers Mm -hmm. a living wage, Mm -hmm. um, is something that you're not going to do as a government because it's going to fuel inflation, when in fact, that subgroup food is outrageously high in terms of inflation. How do you as an economist um, reconcile those two issues? There's a a couple of things here that we need to continue to raise awareness of so the guys can understand well these matters. The first is over the past several years, partially as a result of the war in Ukraine, partially as a result of the pandemic. 
food inflation has been very high across the world. And in fact, I believe um, uh, last year or the year before, the year before, food inflation in Ghana was higher than it was in the United Kingdom, which is a country that was suffering from very severe inflation, the highest level of inflation in the OECD generally. So we've had a very difficult time with food inflation, and we've not seen some sharp fall in the price of food. Rather, we've seen these price levels be maintained. What that has meant is that the purchasing power of consumers has been eaten up by this inflation. You can't buy as much of the market as you could have. And so people are, of course, complaining bitterly about this. When it comes to salary increases, uh, we, you know, we mentioned the 6.6% overall inflation. Uh, public servants getting 6.5% below the rate of inflation. So it's a decrease, not an increase in your purchasing power as a public servant. Uh, first of all, that to me is alarming because it, I don't know why other than uh, a disdain for public servants, you'd want to decrease public servants' purchasing power while simultaneously increasing the budget uh, to $900 billion all told. That to me is, is cruel. Uh, but when it comes also to the inflation issue, one of the things the government is hiding behind is this argument that if you spend more, there'll be uh, additional inflation in Ghana. Now, the first thing we want to note is that when we've had large public servant salary increases in the past, we've not seen substantial amounts of inflation. Uh, before I we increased uh, public servant salaries at the low end by 77%, was there runaway inflation? No, there was not. But the second thing to note is that inflation is tied in many ways to the price of oil. Uh, that sends up costs for uh, fertilizer, for transportation, for electricity, a wide range of things. Uh, but we in Guyana, because we're not an oil producer, we will receive a windfall when you have higher oil prices. And so, as an example, in 2022, as a result of the war in Ukraine, you saw a $60 billion windfall. So you could then take those windfalls and target reducing inflation. So one of the things we talked about was vouchers for canter operators and other people carrying goods from the uh, farm to the market to reduce their costs. We've also spoken about distributing that as a cost of living kind of a um, cost of living adjustment in different households. That's three hundred thousand dollars per household. So just because there is inflation somewhere in the world doesn't mean you have to have inflation in Guyana. We are in a position where, as an oil producer, we get a windfall and therefore have more fiscal space to to deal with uh, the question of inflation. Uh, and so uh, we don't buy the government's arguments and going forward, it will be clearer and clearer that the government has more space uh, to address this issue and that the, the, it's really a choice not to address it. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, let's just call it for what it is. They've claimed to have been, a, been fighting inflation and have failed because the inflation rate is 6.6%. Above the rate of increase for public service. Above. I want to ask you to speak to a particular issue here. Waste, waste of resources. I started out by alluding to the Barbies mm -hmm. fixed bridge idea, when in fact yeah. the floating bridge has not repaid its, mm -hmm. its investors. And there appears to be a situation where the government will be engaging the, the, yeah. the investors in the floating bridge to discuss <laughs> the fixed bridge idea. Over in West Demerara, there's a regional hospital. Yeah. I had suggested mm -hmm. that the government has entered an agreement to sell that property. Mm -hmm. And the Minister of Health has denied it. So in the face of this existing regional hospital at West Demerara, there's going to be the construction of a mega regional hospital at Dikendurin, mm -hmm. also on the West mm -hmm. Demerara. If you're not going to dispose of the West Demerara Regional Hospital complex, why are you building a second regional hospital in the same region? If you're not going to dispose of that regional hospital, why do you not spend less resources mm -hmm. than on the construction mm -hmm. to rehabilitate and properly equip mm -hmm. the existing hospital. These are but two examples of where resources are being wasted yeah. on public infrastructure projects. Do you anticipate more of the same just so that money can be spent and 
sent where it is intended to be sent by this regime. Well, Mark, you, you mentioned a, a new hospital. But what I find to be deeply ironic is that there is a strong chance that you're going to have a new hospital with no nurses inside. Why? Because they're not paying the nurses an appropriate wage to attract nurses and to keep them here. And so that is just an example of the type of thing which is so wrong-headed, a focus totally on infrastructure, but, but, to the neglect of uh, public servants, salaries, training people, and so on. Uh, on that note, may I add a third example? <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> the nursing school in Linden had been shut down. Mm -hmm. But resources have now been appropriated in this budget yeah. to construct a nursing school in Region 2. Yeah. So you shut down one yeah. that was churning out a large number of nurses yeah. and you accused yeah. the head of state of this country accused a reporter, a reporter mm. of um, his country stealing our nurses. Yes. yes so yes. we shut that down and we're going to build another one in region two. Again, wasting resources. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't touch the nursing side because that's a current expenditure situation. Uh, well, the same thing I mentioned it is, the money that is going to be spent on building a new hospital, it seems to me that it's unbelievable or, or ridiculous that you're going to be focusing on building new hospitals when you don't have the appropriate staff Precisely. to run the hospital. Instead, you could direct that money towards compensating nurses so that you have staff, but even your existing hospitals, mm -hmm. are upgrading your existing hospitals appropriately. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is quite clear. In fact, you could take some of that money and, and just make use of the interest from the money to give the nurses a higher, a higher salary. Now, that therefore implies the government is not at all conducting that kind of rational analysis. Now, they're talking about uh, a, a high span bridge, a fixed span bridge for the Burbies River, even though you have an existing bridge there. Um, we would have to ask what feasibility studies have been done. Uh, there's a question as to what is the amount of traffic that is traversing the bridge. Do you need a second bridge? Are you seeing backup back, backs? Uh, are you seeing a backlog of traffic? There's a question of uh, the fare that is being charged on the Burbage River Bridge. Could you not just drop the fare down to zero if it is that you wanted to provide a benefit to the residents of Burbies? Uh, building another another um, bridge there. When these questions are not clear, to me, sounds like it is likely just another, as we say, project for the boys and, and potential waste of money. Now, we want to see uh, residents of Burpees benefit from oil revenues. We want to see them benefit from improvements in our country. They are citizens of Ghana, and we want to represent them in that regard. But what we're saying is, um, it would seem to me to be typical of the PUP and quite tragic. For them to lower the fare in Barbies River Bridge by $100 or $200, focus on building a whole new bridge, when they could just get rid of the fare altogether. And you could benefit immediately from you know, a very large drop in the cost of traversing that bridge. But that's the way that they, they, they approach these problems, not sitting down and thinking these things so clearly. And so as a result, titanic amounts of waste and people of, the people of Ghana not benefiting. Final question for you, Elson Lowe. On Anticipations Budget 2024. The government of Ghana does not treat athletes well. Athletes have gone abroad to represent this country and have complained bitterly about, mm -hmm. about the, the treatment. This government does not invest in the training mm -hmm. of our sportsmen and women simply trying to celebrate them at the end of of a career journey where they they were successful and, and a government of people and people of guyana outside of the family members of that athlete had nothing to do with their mm -hmm. development but again the government is pouring resources into the construction of a stadium here a stadium there mm -hmm. and so on but no human development, no development money is being put into the sports. Mm -hmm. How wise is this as a, as clearly it's a policy, build a stadium, build a stadium, build a track, build a pool, but do not invest in the development of your athletes. Mm -hmm. Where are we going? You, you're a youth, you are an enthusiast, a sports enthusiast, mm -hmm. your take on this. Well, my uh, 
my reading of it is uh, if the government hasn't worked out that they can steal X percentage of a project, it's not particularly interesting to them. Uh, to that end, sports uh, outside of the building of these, uh, these stadiums and whatnot, I think the government doesn't see it as really an opportunity for them to steal, so it's neglected. But uh, if anyone, if you're thinking clearly about athletics in this country, understand that it's valuable for its own sake, citizens reaching their full potential. But also, you look at a country which has a robust tourism industry like Jamaica, known for its music, but also known for its athletes. And that is, in a way, an uh, advertisement for your country and for its tourism product. Come see Jamaica. People know Jamaica. Uh, I, I hazard to say it's one of the best known, if not the best known island in the Caribbean as a result of its athletes, gold medal winners, and so on, as well as its music. Now, because the government isn't thinking in terms of what are the benefits that come from our athletes being known on an international stage, but rather only thinking in terms of what we can do for the, for the friends, family, favorites, and their elite, um, there's an underinvestment in those types of, of, of areas, in athletes, in, in music, in uh, local arts industries. Um, there's that underinvestment. As a result, um, is Guyana's tourism industry flourishing? If you talk to those who are selling in that industry, they say, oh, yeah, I have a few business tourists here, but it's not some major change. You see our rival. But the arrivals are in connection with the oil industry. It's not in connection with the tourism product of Guyana. And so what I think is going on is uh, due to a completely wrong-headed approach, you're seeing areas that could have substantial return, substantial benefit, both in terms of citizens directly and in terms of the economy, really be neglected. We're out of time. I'd like to thank you very much, Elson, for joining me, um, sharing your perspectives on what is to be expected tomorrow, budget 2024. Um, heavy on public infrastructure and heavy on punishing poor people. Huh. I remember um, the treatment of the working poor in this country, and I can only say to you that the People's Progressive Party loves poor people. The People's Progressive Party will continue to do all it can to ensure that more citizens of this country become poor so they can love us some more. My message to you as we go, for Guyana to grow, the PPP must go. Until we meet again, God bless. No more. I can't, I can't no more. It is time for all of Guyana to unite on the one banner and rally against the high cost of living. It's tearing our families apart. Enough is enough. Come rally with the APNU plus AFC Coalition at the Burnham Basketball Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown, on Saturday, January 20th, starting at 5 p.m. Come and hear the leader of the opposition, Aubrey C. Norton, Member of Parliament, as he addresses the nation. Come and hear the AFC leader, Kamraj Ramjatan, all the members of Parliament, members of the private sector, and members of civil society. Yes, Guyanese, it's time to send a message to the incompetent and corrupt PPP. It is time for the people to stand against the high cost of living. Saturday, January 20th at 5 p.m. at Burnham Court, Middle and Carmichael Streets, Georgetown. Come out and let your voices be heard. I can't, I can't no more.